All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, why don't we get started? My name's Eric Fried. I'm with the HIV Drug Resistance Program with the National Cancer Institute. And it's really an honor and a privilege to introduce the 2014 George Corey Memorial Lecture. I didn't have the, the privilege of knowing George Corey, but I've known many of his associates and trainees. I think it's very clear that he was an exceptional person and an exceptional scientist. George was a graduate of Princeton University and earned his MD at Harvard Medical School. In 1976, he became head of the virus tumor biology section in the Laboratory of Molecular Virology at the NCI. Four years later, he became chief of that laboratory. In 1981, he uh, won the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Government Service. And in 1987, at the age of 43, the year in which he died tragically young, he was elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. George, in his relatively short career, published over 140 papers deciphering mechanisms of eukaryotic transcription, often using viruses, in particular SV40, as a model system. He had a very distinguished group of trainees and colleagues and collaborators. These are listed here. The star indicates a National Academy of Science member. This lecture series has been equally distinguished. I'm showing a number of, of former George Curry lecturers here. Several of these were Nobel laureates and a large number National Academy of Science members. So I think it's fitting that we have today Paul Binoche to give the 2014 George Corey Lecture. Paul got, uh, did his, his training uh, in the UK and then in 1996 came to do postdoctoral research at Duke University with Brian Cullen. He then in 1999 went to the uh, Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center at Rockefeller and climbed up through the ranks there, now being a uh, tenured professor and head of the Laboratory of Retrovirology at Rockefeller. He's earned a number of awards, which I've listed here. And he's known for uh, a large number of, of scientific contributions, including elucidation of HIV co-receptor interactions, HIV-1 transcription regulation work that he did with Brian Cullen as a postdoc. His work has provided key insights in the field of HIV-1 assembly and host factors involved in virus budding. He's made major contributions to the field of so-called paleovirology. He successfully adapted HIV-1 to replicate in non-human primates. I think you might be talking about some of that work today. And he's elucidated the anti-HIV innate immune response and co-discovered several antiviral restriction factors, including a factor known as tetherin. This is an image taken from his 2008 Nature paper showing the very dramatic uh, trapping of HIV-1 particles at the surface of cells expressing tetherin. Paul is not only a distinguished scientist, he's also an excellent colleague. And just to illustrate this, I've, I've uh, added here a, an email exchange that Paul and I had just after that 2008 Nature paper was published. And I say something to the fact that this is probably your thousandth request for the HA tag tethering construct in the past week, so on and so forth, but you know, we'd like uh, to request these vectors from you. This email was sent at 11, 12 a.m. on a Friday. At uh, 11, 17, five minutes later, I re received a response, an apologetic response, saying that, well, uh, no problem, but my land man manager is sick today, so we'll send the, the plasmids next week. And indeed, first thing Monday morning, they were sent to me by Federal Express. So it's really uh, an honor and a privilege to uh, uh, introduce Paul B. Nash for today's George Corey Lecture. Well, um, thank you very much, Eric, for that uh, very kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to, to be here. Um, I must confess I, I didn't know uh, George Corey. We came from uh, different scientific generations. I was an undergraduate when he passed away uh, some years ago, but it's, it's obvious to me from talking to the people who knew him uh, what an enormous level of respect and affection that he commanded, and I'm deeply honored uh, to give this lecture uh, in his name. So, as Eric told you, I'm interested in very many aspects of retrovirus replication, um, and particularly uh, the ability or otherwise of, of retroviruses to colonize cells of, one, of a particular type or species. 
And for many years, we thought that um, this uh, differential ability to infect different cells was based on the ability or otherwise of retroviruses to parasitize an array of molecules that are provided to it by a candidate host cell that are required for its replication. But more recently, in the past decade or so, we've come to realize that that's only half the story and that evolution has endowed uh, host cells with an range of, a range of defense mechanisms um, that, uh, whose specific job it, it is to attenuate uh, virus and particular retrovirus replication. And so I'm going to talk to you about these intrinsic antiviral defenses. Let's start with a definition. These are different to what you understand as the uh, conventional adaptive and innate immune systems. These are germline encoded proteins whose major or only function is to directly inhibit virus replication or uh, to reduce cellular permissiveness uh, to virus replication. Some of these proteins are constitutively expressed. Some are, in, are induced by type 1 interferons. Some of them have a very broad antiviral uh, specificity, and some of them have clearly evolved uh, to target particular types of viruses. And so this is a field that's somewhat in its infancy. It's been uh, really expanded over the last decade or so. And so the, the key questions are quite fundamental. What are the molecules involved? How do they work? And how do viruses, and in our particular case, how do retroviruses evade them? Um, there are also some e interesting evolutionary questions that I'll touch on briefly today. From where did they originate and, and how have they evolved? And um, from a practical concept point of view, can we make use of knowledge of them um, um, in, in ways that are uh, useful? And I'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. So we're able to identify such um, antiretroviral activities based on a, a phenomenon of uh, permissive and non-permissive cells. And so in permissive cells, uh, you put a small amount of virus onto a cell culture and get a large amount of virus, virus out. That obviously doesn't occur in non-permissive cells because replication can be blocked at particular steps in the retroviral life cycle. And the difference between uh, these two states can be governed by what species the cells come from. Uh, sometimes it's revealed only when you delete accessory genes from the viral genome, and often it can be induced by treatment um, with interferon. And so the key experiment is to toggle between these two uh, phenotypes by transferring genes from non-permissive cells to permissive cells and making them non-permissive or vice versa, by depleting, depleting genes from non-permissive cells and then making them permissive. So how do you uh, choose what candidate genes to target? Well, there are a variety of ways. We can make um, cDNA libraries from a particular resistant species and screen for resistant cells. Uh, an approach that's been useful to us and several others in the field is to do simple microarray experiments where you compare permissive and non-permissive cells and look for genes that are selectively expressed in the non-permissive state. And more recently, what we have done is to build arrayed libraries of interferon-stimulated genes. Uh, these are a particularly rich source of antiviral proteins. As I'm sure you know, uh, treatment of cells with type 1 interferon induces what's known as the as the rather poorly understood so-called antiviral state. Genes induced by uh, interferon are obviously responsible for this, and some of them, at least, have a direct antiviral activity. And so the first story that I'll, I'll tell you about involves an HIV-1 accessory protein, uh, VPU. It's a small protein, uh, a membrane protein. It has a transmembrane domain and a short cytoplasmic tail. Um, for a while, something of a scientific backwater in HIV research, because in most cells, VPU isn't required for virus replication. You can delete it from the viral genome. The virus is quite happy. But as first shown here by Klaus Strabel and others, there are some cells in which a VPU-deleted virus has a, a significant defect. And it's a particular defect at the, at the time at which one would expect virus particles to be released from cells. So a wild-type HIV-1 strain replicates 
uh, nicely through permissive and non-permissive cells, whereas a VPU-deleted strain replicates nicely through so-called permissive cells, but fails to release particles from infected uh, non-permissive cells. And our entry into this field involved the, the finding that the virions that are uh, produced by these VPU-deleted viruses are fully formed, apparently fully functioned, but retained on the surface of cells by protease-sensitive uh, tethers. And another key observation that really helped us uh, to uh, find what the molecule involved was, was that the non-permissive state could simply be in, uh, induced by treating the cells uh, with type 1 interferon. And so in the absence of interferon, most cells would release virus. Uh, uh, in the absence of VPU, but you treat those cells with interferon, and suddenly VPU becomes uh, required. And so by taking some cells in which the non-permissive state was constitutive and other cells in which it could be induced by a type 1 interferon, and comparing the genes that were expressed with those expressed in permissive cells, we could triangulate and isolate a, a, a cDNA that appeared to be a good candidate um, for being responsible for this phenotype. And that uh, gene encodes a protein that we have called uh, tetherin, uh, for reasons that will become clear if they are not already. It's a protein of about 190 amino acids. Uh, it's a very unusual protein in that it, in that it has a, both a transmembrane domain and a GPI anchor that are linked by a rod shape that is predominantly coiled coil. That was uh, shown by Yong Zhong, who we collaborated with on structural studies. Um, and so th this was a, a prime candidate um, for the uh, induction of this phenotype. And just looking at a cartoon picture of this, uh, this protein inspires hypotheses as to how it might work, and as I will uh, show you in a moment. But just to show you the phenotype associated with it, Eric stole on my thunder a little bit by showing this slide already, but it is a rather important slide in, in my career. Um, and so what this slide shows is that tetherin indeed imposes a requirement for a HIV-1 VPU. So this is a single cycle replication experiment done in a normally permissive cell, and so a wild type and VPU deleted virus yield about the same amount of virus in a single cycle of replication. But if you engineer that uh, cell to express this one extra gene, uh, then it imposes a very strong requirement, about 100-fold in this uh, single cycle of replication for VPU. Um, and, and as Eric showed you, if you express this, this protein on um, otherwise permissive cell, infect them with a VPU-deleted virus, you get this very impressive accumulation of virion particles that doesn't happen when the virus is either wild-type or the cells don't have the tetherin protein. So how does this uh, protein work? Well, of course, when, one, when confronted with a, a problem such as this, one of the things one does is to make lots of mutants of the protein and, and ask what parts of the protein are required for function. And one thing we quickly and rather frustratingly found that it was actually very difficult to make mutants of this protein that lacked function. Um, and although that was, was initially disappointed, it inspired an experiment that was ultimately quite satisfying. And so what we did was, in effect, to take the tetherin protein and mutate almost every amino acid in the protein simultaneously. Um, put another way, we rebuilt a protein from components that have no sequence homology to tetherin but are expected to have a similar overall configuration and topology. And so we took a bit of this protein, a bit of this protein, and a bit of that protein, put them together to make a protein that should sit in the membrane, uh, something like this. And remarkably enough, it worked. So here's the surface of cells infected with a Delta VPU virus that don't express tetherin, the wild-type tetherin, and our so-called artificial tetherin. And you can see that this um, protein that has effectively no sequence homology can recapitulate the biological activity of the native tetherin protein. So that, to us, strongly suggested that um, it, it was very unlikely that tetherin was doing something sophisticated or complicated in order to generate um, this virion 
tethering phenotype. If, for example, tethering had to send a signal to cells to activate a program that caused virion, virion tethering, it would be extremely unlikely that we'd recapitulate that with this, um, with this experiment. Far more likely it was, in our view, that tethering acts directly to trap viruses on the surface. And so subsequently, we've done an experiment that I think um, quite compellingly demonstrates that. We took advantage of this very um, uh, dramatic permissivity in terms of alteration of sequence um, to put uh, protea specific protease cleavage sites, for example, a factor 10 cleavage site just here, and then also epitope tags at various positions in the protein, and then ask whether uh, treatment of the surface of cells with that protease would release virions. And indeed, that proves to be the case. So here we have cells that have been infected with a VPU minus virus for various times as the viral proteins accumulate here. And then at those various time points, we either incubate them with buffer or briefly with factor 10A protease. And you can see that the, the, the cleavage of the tethering protein releases uh, the viral particle. And this only works if you program the tethering protein to have um, the cleavage site. Also, quite interestingly, is that fragments of the tethering protein are released along with the virus. And by playing games with uh, where you position the epitope tags, you can demonstrate that most of the time, about three quarters of the time, virions are held by tethering proteins in this configuration, with the GPI anchor infiltrating the virus particle and the transmembrane domain uh, retained uh, in the cell. And so this is a, a simple, uh, I'd argue quite elegant mechanism by which cells can uh, express a protein that would, uh, in a very um, broad, with very broad specif specificity, uh, trap virions on the cell surface. Uh, but it you've also would, will be clear to you um, that this only works with viruses that don't have a VPU protein. And so VPU is in, at least in part, the virus's answer to tethering. And what VPU does is to bind to the tethering protein. Uh, many groups have shown this using co-IP assays. What I'm showing here is a, a cross-linking assay where we've um, essentially placed cysteines at various positions uh, in the VPU transmembrane domain and also in the tethering transmembrane domain. And so express those single amino acid substituted proteins uh, in various uh, cells. And then if you do an immunoprecipitation assay where you pull on the HA tag after denaturing the sample and then run a Western blot for the flag tag, you can find a complex um, that's uh, consistent with a dimer of tethering cross-linked to one or two molecules of VPU. So you get the cysteines in the right place, and only if you get them in the right place, you can form these covalently linked uh, complexes indicating that these domains are in uh, roughly in molecular uh, proximity to each other in the membrane. Uh, we can get genetic evidence in support of that claim uh, based on experiments such as this. So the HIV-1 VPU protein is an efficient antagonist of the tethering protein that's found in humans. Uh, so that assay is, is shown here. So here we've, we're just expressing increasing amounts of the tethering protein and asking it to inhibit the release of infectious HIV-1 particles as measured by uh, uh, an indicator cell. And you can see that tethering does that very nicely to a VPU minus virus, whereas a VPU competent virus uh, antagonizes tethering and, and, and is resistant. Now, Importantly, and remember this for, for what follows, if you take a monkey tethering protein, or even in this case simply replace the transmembrane domain of the human tethering with that from a monkey tethering protein, then this interaction fails. And although, although the chimeric tethering is fully active, it's completely resistant to the VPU protein, cementing the idea that the interaction between these two proteins is both biochemically and functionally mediated by their transmembrane domains. Okay, so this is an a, a, a interesting um, mechanism, not, not previously described for, um, uh, in the context of virology, and not, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, 
associated with any uh, particular cellular activity. Um, and unlike uh, other antiviral proteins that have been discovered, uh, tetherin doesn't have any obvious uh, activities from which it's derived. It's not, um, not related to any other proteins that are found uh, in, the, in the human genome. Um, and so we became interested in how did this activity evolve? Where did it come from? Uh, it's a, a rather strange thing for, for cells to do other than in the context of the inhibition of, of uh, viral particles release. So how, how mechanistically did this activity arise? And so in order to begin exploring this, we began to look in, uh, uh, to see how old the tethering gene was. What, what was it descended from? And so when we look in the, the genomes of, of modern organisms, you can find proteins that have uh, the configuration of tethering. And I should point out that other than tethering, there's no other protein of which we are aware that has this configuration, a transmembrane domain, an extracellular coil coil, and a GPI anchor. But you can find uh, proteins that have that uh, configuration in a roughly syntonous position in the genomes of anything that's descend, uh, descended from, from uh, ancestral amniotes. So uh, reptiles have it, uh, eutherian mammals have it, marsupials have it. It seems to be uh, missing in monotremes, but anything that's more distant, for example, amphibians, they don't appear to have a tethering protein. And the equivalent position, and we've deduced the ancestral configuration of the order of genes by looking at modern genomes, that position is unoccupied uh, in amphibians. So it looks as if tethering came into existence at some point uh, greater than 300 million years ago, but less than 370 million years ago, between the time that amphibians uh, diverged from the amniote lineage, lineage and reptiles did. And so if you look at the sequences of these tethering proteins that diverged about 300 million years ago, you'll see that they're, they're very distantly related. Um, either there hasn't been a strong pressure to maintain sequence or there's been pressure to diversify sequence or both. Um, and if you line up the sequences of, for example, Tasmanian devil tethering, uh, human and alligator tethering, you'll find very few positions in the alignment where amino acids are conserved. And in fact, um, some of you might think that this alignment is a bit contrived, and it is. Uh, it's very difficult to, to align these, uh, these proteins together. They're very diverse. Obviously, that makes tracing its origins uh, quite uh, challenging. But despite this uh, very large degree of sequence divergence, all of these proteins, the human, Tasmanian devil, and alligator tethering, are very potent inhibitors of HIV-1 particle release. Obviously, the HIV-1 VPU protein has only learned uh, to antagonize the human tether and doesn't do anything against these more, um, uh, more distant tetherings. And so um, how does one go about uh, finding the origins of, of a protein that has this level of, of sequence diversity? And in fact, by just inspecting the genes that are in chromosomes around where tethering uh, is localized, we found this rather interesting protein, PV1, um, that in both in eutherian mammals and in alligators and in the deduced ancestral configuration is positioned next to um, the, the, the tethering gene. And a common mechanism for, the, uh, for how new genes arise is duplication of neighboring genes. Um, but there's no, there's no sequence homology, as far as you can, we can tell, between modern versions of tethering and PV1, but there's a significant degree of organizational or structural homology. And in fact, just like tethering, PV1 is a dimeric protein that has a cytoplasmic tail, a transmembrane domain, and then an extracellular coil coil. It's quite a bit longer than tethering, but the only really major difference is that uh, tethering has a GPI anchor and PV1 has a proline-rich domain at its C terminus. And the function of PV1 is to make things like this, um, st uh, stomatal diaphragms on, on cavioli, for example. And basically what it does is multimerize via its proline-rich domain uh, to make lids on, on these uh, cavioli. And so we thought, well, perhaps 
it seemed a little bit of an outlandish hypothesis, but not, not, um, not too ridiculous to suppose that perhaps tetherin might have descended from a duplicate copy of PV1. And sort of consistent with that idea, if one uh, reconstructs what might be a putative in evolutionary intermediate, if you take a GPI anchor from tetherin and put it on the C terminus uh, of PV1, you can change PV1 from a protein that's uh, essentially inactive in terms of inhibiting virus particle release to one that is almost as active as, as wild type tetherin, and at least as active as the artificial tetherin that I, I told you about uh, a few moments ago. And perhaps even more compellingly, when we look very closely, and in fact, um, deduce the ancestral sequence of PV1 using maximum likelihood methods to uh, basically uh, determine what, the, what the, the approximate sequence was of PV1 300 million years ago before it putatively uh, duplicated to, to make tetherin. If you do that, then you start to see significant, statistically significant low levels, but statistically significant homology between ancestral PV1 and some extant versions of tetherin. So these are, uh, this is a fragment of the um, modern version of tetherin found in primates aligned to the ancestral PV1. This is, isn't the only uh, fragment of homology, but it begins to become somewhat more convincing that in fact uh, tetherin may have been descended um, from, from the PV1 protein. Okay, so just to summarize what I've told you about this first antiviral defense mechanism that I've told you about. So tetherin is an, an ancient antiviral protein that traps HIV-1 variants. I didn't mention this, but it actually has very broad specificity. The fact that it works simply by infiltrating lipid envelopes makes essentially any envelope virus fair game, and many envelope viruses are susceptible to uh, in their release being inhibited by tetherin because, in effect, it targets an indispensable invariant host component of the virus, and there's no specific interaction with viral proteins that's required. Of course, this has some important biological consequences. Of course, it very much reduces the opportunity for viruses to evolve resistance. You can't become resistant to tetherin just by uh, simple changes in amino acid sequence. Rather, it provides the impetus for the acquisition of new antagonist activities, as exemplified by VPU. But as it turns out, there are many other ways in which tetherin is an antagonized by other viruses. In the SIVs, the NEF protein uh, uh, can take on this role. Sometimes the envelope protein of SIVs and other viruses can take on the role of tetherin antagonist. But this specialization of antagonist to uh, tetherin proteins that are very variable in sequence between species uh, makes a virus quite specialized to a particular host, and this is a theme that will recur and can be a potential barrier uh, consequently to cross-species transmission. And so let me move on now to talk about a, a second antiviral uh, mechanism that we've discovered, uh, which we found using uh, similar approaches, but actually works in a completely different way, uh, and actually works to protect target cells uh, from infection. And this arises from, the, from a, a, a set of experiments where we, that we did in the lab, uh, where we compared the ability of various cell lines to resist HIV-1 infection, incoming HIV-1 infection, uh, when treated with type 1 interferon. And so here's that, here's that experiment done with three uh, monocyte cell line, THP1, K562, uh, et cetera. And you can see that in this cell line, interferon has a rather dramatic effect on HIV infection, and very little effect on infection in, in these two cell lines. So if you simply compare the genes that are induced by interferon here with those that are inter in induced by interferon here, and select those that are only upregulated here, you get a list of candidate genes, and then if you express those individual genes in permissive cells and then infect them with an HIV GFP reporter virus, you find that among those candidates, one of them, the MX2 protein, can inhibit uh, HIV-1 infection. This is the result for the human 
and the, the monkey uh, MX2 protein. A, a modest but clearly significant inhibition of HIV infection. So here you can see how the MX2 protein is induced by interferon in THP1 cells. And when, when that happens, interferon inhibits in HIV-1 infection. But if those cells are expressing a short hairpin RNA against MX2, its induction by interferon is, is very dramatically blunted. Um, and then interferon has rather minor, if any, effects on, on HIV infection. So uh, this protein is sufficient to inhibit HIV-1 infection. And at least in this particular cell context, not in all cell contexts, but at least in this particular cell context, is required for the full antiviral uh, activity of interferon alpha. So what is MX2? It's actually a member of a family of proteins, the MX proteins that have a, a pretty rich history as, as antiviral proteins. There are dynamin-like uh, GTPases, uh, this is a, a crystal structure of the so-called MX1 proteins, which have long been known to have uh, antiviral activity against a range of RNA viruses. Uh, the MX2 proteins, so th this part of the tree here, this is a tree of MX protein sequences. The MX1 and MX2, as I've labeled them here, the field has messed up the nomenclature. So what I call MX1 and MX2 isn't necessarily the same as, as what you'll read in the literature, so that you'll find some literature MX1s and 2s in here, and even MX3s. Um, but phylogenetically, MX2s are here. These have not previously been shown to have antiviral activity, and actually were thought to have um, other functions. Um, so these proteins uh, are found in uh, eutherian mammals, and there are more distant relatives found in, in other vertebrates, uh, all the way down to, to, to lampreys. Now, it appears that anti-HIV-1 activity is a rather more recently evolved activity in MX proteins as compared uh, to tetherin proteins. So if you take MX2 proteins, so proteins in this clade from primates, they almost universally have anti-HIV-1 activity. If you go outside primates uh, to sheep and dog, no anti-HIV-1 activity. So in this experiment, we've... Um, put MX2 under a doxycycline inducible promoter, and so only when, only when you do induce with dox you get this approximately one log inhibition of HIV-1 infection. And so what's different about the primate uh, MX2 proteins as compared to the non-primate uh, MX2 proteins is that they very nicely and specifically localize to nuclear pores. Um, I don't know if there's if the lights can be dimmed further. I'm not sure if you can see the red staining here for nuclear pores, but you can see it quite clearly here. Um, this is a stain for NUP90 in red and DNA in blue, and this is MX2, and if the closer you look, the more convincing the co-localization between MX2 and nuclear pores have become. So this is a, a prominent feature of all of the primate MX2s that we have analyzed and is much less evident or, mu or not evident at all in the non-primate MX2 proteins. So another thing that's different about the MX2 proteins as compared to MX1 and other proteins is that it has this amino terminal extension, and this appears to be the interesting part of the protein. It has that a nuclear pore localization signal contained within the amino terminal 25 amino acids, and those amino acids are absolutely required for antiviral activity. I'll spare you the details, but we've done um, in collaboration with my former postdoc, Sam Wilson, a number of experiments with various HIV mutants that uh, indicate that the next portion of the protein from residues about 25 through 90 contain uh, specificity determinants which govern what, which, which particular viruses uh, are inhibited by MX2. And if you look at the sequence of various MX2 proteins, you can see that this amino terminus looking at DNDS ratios or probability of DNDS ratios being greater than one, that this is the most rapidly evolving uh, portion of the protein, although other parts of the protein appear to be uh, quite uh, rapidly uh, evolving too. So, um, as I say, this uh, amino terminus appears to be what governs the anti-retroviral anti activity 
of uh, the MX2 proteins and appears to have been quite, quite recently re acquired. Um, so it's the capsid of the, of the HIV-1 protein that determines whether it's sensitive to MX2 or not. So here's a wild-type HIV-1 strain. We've infected cells with increasing amounts of virus in the absence or the presence of MX2. You'll see it's not a, a very potent inhibitor, but it, it clearly does inhibit infection. Uh, but you can find mutants in capsid. This one is particularly interesting because it's a mutant that converts HIV-1 from uh, a cell cycle independent virus to one that can only infect uh, dividing cells. That mutation makes HIV-1 completely resistant to MX2, as does this mutation, which, uh, among other things, uh, in, uh, blocks binding to a host protein cyclophilin and also changes uh, the, the nuclear porin requirement for HIV-1 infection. And in fact, there are a number of mutations that one can identify throughout the viral capsid that confer partial or complete resistance to, to MX2. So you might ask, why doesn't the virus just make these changes? Well, every one of these changes comes at a significant fitness cost uh, to the virus. We, even if you grow virus in cells expressing MX2, you can get resistant virus, but those viruses invariably have a, have a fitness penalty associated with them. Uh, mutating capsid is something that the virus can do, but it's one of the most genetically fragile, in fact, it's the most genetically fragile protein that's ever, ever been analyzed by random mutagenesis, and most mutations in capsid are, in fact, lethal. Um, and so this, this finding that MX2 localizes quite specifically at nuclear pores, and its sensitivity of the virus is manipulated when you change the route by which HIV gains access to the nucleus, made us consider the hypothesis that perhaps what MX2 does is simply patrol uh, nuclear pores and intercept uh, HIV-1 particles as they attempt uh, to infect cells. And consistent with that idea, um, if you express MX2 in this particular cell line, um, and uh, as you can see here, in, in this cell line, MX2 is causing about a five-fold uh, decrease in HIV infectivity on this cell when it's dividing. If you growth arrest that cell, it doesn't perceptibly affect HIV-1 infection, because HIV-1 infection doesn't require cell division, but very dramatically increases the potency of MX2, uh, consistent with the notion uh, that what MX2 uh, likely does is to, uh, as I mentioned, sit on the uh, nuclear pore and basically intercept viruses as they try to um, uh, enter the nucleus. Um, I didn't show this, but it's true that MX2 inhibits infection by a, a, an array of primate lentiviruses. Um, it reduces the abundance of DNA forms that are selectively found in the nucleus. It doesn't affect reverse transcription in any way at all. The virus synthesizes normal levels of DNA. It just appears not to get uh, into the nucleus. As I've mentioned, it localizes the nuclear pore and is a more potent uh, inhibitor of non-dividing cells. And as HIV-1 capsid um, uh, is the major determinant that governs nuclear entry, um, it stands to reason and is true that the HIV-1 capsid determines whether a virus is sensitive or resistant to this particular uh, host inhibitor. Okay, so I've gone um, over in some detail a couple of the antiviral mechanisms that, that we've been involved in studying. I should mention at, at, at this point that both of those mechanisms were also discovered in other labs. So John Guatelli was co-discoverer of tetherin, and Michael Malim's group uh, uh, co-discovered that the... Uh, and Chang, Chen Liang's group uh, in Toronto co-discovered that MX2 uh, is an inhibitor of HIV-1 infection. What I'm going to do now is talk very briefly about two other um, antiviral mechanisms that target HIV-1 because they are important for, for the, the last part of what I'll talk, talk to you about uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay. And so two other antiviral mechanisms are... Uh, are induced by the, the so-called APOBEC3 and TRIM5 antiviral proteins. 
So the APOBEC3 proteins, discovered to be antiviral in, in Mike Malim's lab, uh, infiltrate retroviral particles right along with them until they infect new cells. And during the process of reverse transcription, these are uh, single-strand specific cytidine deaminase and hypermutate the nat nascent minor strand uh, of, of the viral DNA. And they mutate it to such a degree um, that the, the mutagenesis is lethal. A, a very large fraction of the cytidines are deaminated, uh, causing massive changes in the coding potential of the, of the viral genome. But in, in a conceptually similar way that HIV's developed an antagonist of tethering in the form of the VPU protein, uh, so it has also developed an antagonist that uh, effectively denudes infected cells of uh, the APOBEC3 protein. And so uh, lentiviral VIF proteins bind directly to APOBEC3 proteins and also to a ubiquitin ligase complex that mediates the degradation of APOBEC3 protein. So it's effectively removed from uh, infected cells. And, and again, in conceptually much the same way that VPU has evolved to be rather specific to the, the particular variants of tetherin it finds in its natural target cells, so the same is true of VIF proteins. So HIV-1 VIF proteins are very effective killers of human APOBEC3 proteins, but don't touch um, uh, monkey APOBEC3 proteins. And the, the converse is true of SIV VIF proteins. They're very effective inhibitors of, of monkey APOBEC3 proteins, but do not touch the human protein. Another antiviral mechanism discovered in, the, in Joe Sodrowski's lab um, works in a, a conceptually similar way to MX2. Um, this protein binds directly, and it's actually been demonstrated to bind directly to incoming HIV capsids and blocks progression of the viral life cycle. The difference from MX2 is this happens before reverse transcription rather than after. Um, and uh, there's again a species-specific component to this uh, activity. So the human TRIM5 protein doesn't touch HIV-1 capsids. HIV-1 has either evolved or was already resistant to the human TRIM5 protein. But the TRIM5 proteins that you find in monkeys are very effective inhibitors of HIV-1 infection. And so together, these, these two proteins in particular uh, can create a very profound barrier uh, to HIV-1 replication uh, in monkey cells. And at the, at the time we started the project that, that I'm about to tell you about, these were the only two defense mechanisms that we knew about that differed sufficiently between human and monkey cells to create uh, this uh, species-dependent barrier to HIV-1 uh, replication. And this is not just of academic interest. Um, as, I'm sure, as I'm sure you will have deduced if you weren't already aware, HIV-1 doesn't uh, infect any species other than humans and chimpanzees. And this creates a, a barrier to the generation of, of animal models of HIV-1 infection. Um, while there are various types of animal models, there are, uh, for example, immunodeficient mice that, uh, can, in which you can grow uh, human immune cells. The mice themselves don't develop an immune system, uh, while well, they develop a partial immune system, and HIV can grow in them, but they're clearly not immunocompetent mice. Um, the mainstay of, of AIDS research in immunocompetent hosts are simian immunodeficiency viruses that have been isolated macaques, and chimeras uh, between those SIVs uh, containing parts of HIV-1. And while these are very, very useful, um, um, one would obviously very much like to have a model that's, that uh, involves an intact or nearly intact HIV-1 strain because the SIV components of these viruses are quite divergent. About 50% of their amino acids are different from HIV-1. And so, of course, this complicates the preclinical evaluation of vaccines and sometimes even drug candidates um, that are effective against HIV-1 but don't work on SIV. And so what we have been doing recently is to ask the question, can we use engineering and adaptation approaches to develop HIV-1 strains that can replicate in non-humans, specifically in macaques, as a better animal model of, of human AIDS. 
And so uh, one thing that uh, encouraged us in this endeavor was a finding that we made some years ago that the TRIM5 protein, this potent inhibitor of HIV-1 replication, is sort of knocked out in pigtail macaques. And so the, the part of the protein that recognizes the HIV-1 capsid uh, in our monkeys, as shown by Jeremy Lubin, and in pigtail macaques, as shown by our group and several others, has been replaced as the result of a retrotransposition event by a cyclophilin A, uh, a cDNA. Uh, and this results in a fusion protein. And in the particular case of pigtail macaque, the cyclophilin portion has evolved in such a way that it no longer recognizes HIV-1. Presumably, it evolved to chase some other retrovirus, but the, the main point is that pigtail macaques lack this very potent block to HIV-1 uh, replication in that species. And if you take uh, uh, cells from pigtail macaques and ask HIV-1 to grow in it, you can get a little bit of replication. It's not nearly as much as you'd get with an, an SIV strain, so this is a strain that's very pathogenic in uh, uh, pigtail macaques and grows very nicely in them. This is accumulation of reverse transcriptase over, over time after infection. But if we make one change in the HIV genome, that is to substitute the VIF gene, the gene that's responsible for killing the APOBEC3 proteins, if we change the HIV-1 version to one from simian immunodeficiency virus, so you have a, a now a viral genome that's 93% HIV-1 and just has this single gene from SIV, that virus then grows very nicely in these pigtail uh, macaque uh, uh, lymphocytes, almost as well as the pathogenic SIV. And so at this point, we teamed up with Jeff Lifson's group and Vineet Kiwal Romani at NCI Frederick and took uh, viruses like this, uh, an HIV-1 expressing an SIV VIF gene. We gave it um, uh, physiologically relevant envelopes from prototypes, so-called for the aficionados, R5 tropic HIV strains, and infected uh, pigtail macaques. And over the next few slides, what you're going to see on the bottom are two charts one that measures the amount of virus in the blood of those macaques uh, with weeks after infection, and another that tracks a, uh, a pathogenic consequence of HIV or SIV infection, the number of CD4 positive T cells uh, in the blood over the, the same uh, time frame. And what we found in these um, uh, passage one macaques is that we got a reasonable take of virus up to about 100,000 copies of RNA per milliliter of plasma, this is about between 1% and 10% of the level one would expect to find in humans and hope to find uh, in an animal model. Uh, thereafter, virus replication is, was almost completely curtailed in one animal and controlled to low levels uh, in, a, in another animal. Um, and then after about uh, 30 or so weeks of infection, we gave the animals an injection of an anti-CD8 antibody to relieve some of the immune pressure and essentially boost the population size. And I'm just going to show you this for one animal. Wherever you see one of these triangles, that means an anti-CD8 anti -CD8 antibody infusion. And the consequence of that is a temporary uh, removal of the CD8 cells from the peripheral uh, circulation. So the CD8 cells are effectively depleted from blood and from lymph nodes. They're almost untouched in the gut. Uh, that depletion lasts for two to eight weeks, and then the CD8 cells return to their uh, pre-depletion uh, levels. So when we do that, we get a spike of virus, which we then use to initiate passage two. You'll note in these passage one animals, there's no sign of CD4 decline or pathogenic consequence associated with this infection. Uh, in passage two, we got a, another reasonable take of virus. And in passage two, and every passage afterwards, unless I specify otherwise, we gave the animals an anti-CD8 antibody to just deplete their CD8 cells for a few weeks after initial infection, just to give the, the virus an assist, for want of a better word. So we got, uh, again, a nice take of virus, and then uh, virus persisted at about 10,000 copies per mil. After another 20 or so weeks, we depleted uh, CD8 cells, uh, took virus from this animal initiated passage three and passage four and so on. And I'll jump to passage four because passage three was rather uneventful, but something changed uh, quite dramatically and importantly 
uh, at passage 4. So the first thing I'll show you are the numbers of CD4 cells in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. This is a, a somewhat uh, more sensitive indicator of the ability of a virus to uh, deplete CD4 cells in an animal. And in all three of these animals, the number of CD4 cells would decline to, to very low levels uh, quite soon after infection and were retained at low levels uh, thereafter. Um, uh, Jake Estes, who's the, 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 who, who did these immunostainings, noted um, some quite clear pathological changes in these animals. So these are lymph node stains for KI67 before infection, and you can see disruption of the, the architecture of the lymph node uh, uh, in this particular animal where the changes were especially evident. And also college, collagen deposition, a sort of scarring of the lymph nodes uh, that again is commonly seen in progressive HIV-1 infection um, and SIV infection in humans and macaques respectively. But most importantly, um, the virus replication in one particular animal, P4C, was very poor, uh, actually not controlled at all, continued at extremely high levels. The CD4 cells were effectively removed uh, from the animal and were nearly undetectable at uh, 28 weeks after infection, at which time the animal had to be euthanized uh, with a rather classic case of AIDS. First time that AIDS had been induced by HIV-1 in a non-hominid uh, species. And so the animal had to be sacrificed because it had tumors. Uh, those tumors were widely disseminated, shown here in the kidney. These are B-cell tumors, um, commonly associated with herpes viruses that are found uh, uh, in, in many primate species. So one classical AIDS-defining condition. A second AIDS-defining uh, condition in the same animal, these black spots are pneumocystis uh, organisms as revealed by this stain, uh, not found uh, in, in control animals. Of course, one dead monkey does not a compelling story make. So we took blood from this animal and passed it to four more macaques. And in this uh, passage, we left the animals otherwise untreated, so just infected, and then two animals were also CD8 depleted at the time of infection. The CD8 depleted animals effectively recapitulated the, uh, the finding with P4C, very high levels of um, virus replication and had to be uh, euthanized either very quickly or at some time later uh, for clinical uh, cause and profound loss of CD4 positive T cells. The, the other two animals, those that were not CD8 depleted, there, were virus, there was a good take of virus, but then it was a very rapidly controlled, and those animals had a, a course of infection that, one, that at least superficially resembles that associated with a, a, a very minority, small minority of human uh, infections, the so-called long-term non-progressors. Uh, at a later time point, we did a CD8 depletion in those two animals, and while we got a spike of viremia, it very rapidly uh, returned to its pre-depletion levels. And importantly, in no way recapitulated the effect of CD8 depletion that was done uh, early during infection. And this suggests that in this model in particular, and perhaps more generally, the battles that are fought between HIV and the immune system during this very early window of infection uh, can be really deterministic of subsequent clinical course. And we can sort of toggle between rapid progression and elite control simply by the inclusion or, or lack of inclusion of this uh, simple immunological uh, manipulation during those first uh, few weeks of infection. So we could again re recapitulate this phenotype by taking uh, blood from from P5C and infecting two more monkeys. Again, when we, one animal was CD8 depleted, rapid progression and death. Um, and then in the other animal that was not CD8 depleted, uh, effective, effective control. So obviously something was different here to here. What, what, did, what if anything, interesting happened to the virus during this passage series in macaques? In how did it adapt? Uh, to, be, to become more virulent in its, in its new host. 
Well, as you will remember from the first uh, part of the talk, and I deliberately neglected to, to mention when I talked about adaptation to the, to the, to the, um, to the macaques, um, you'll recall that HIV-1 has an antagonist of a tethering protein called VPU that, that uh, inhibits this antiviral protein. But I also told you that it doesn't work in monkeys, and it in really actually doesn't work in pigtail macaques either. And so we infected animals with a virus that was incapable of dealing with this uh, new anti with this antiviral protein. But what happened over the course of passage was that mutations occurred in the transmembrane domain of VPU, the very domain that's responsible for the interaction uh, with tethering. And so um, while the wild-type VPU was, uh, cannot antagonize the, the pigtail macaque tethering protein, and so pigtail macaque tethering uh, inhibits an, an HIV-1 strain that has the wild-type VPU, these mutations in the transmembrane domain conferred on VPU the ability to antagonize the pigtail macaque tethering. So indeed, VPU gained function, i.e. the ability to antagonize macaque tethering during this adaptation protein uh, process. Another thing happened that we weren't uh, expecting. We found some unusual mutations in capsid, some mutations that are rarely and some, in some cases never found in uh, uh, HIV-1 sequences that are found in humans. Here they are uh, depicted on the HIV-1 capsid protein. And what these mutations appear to do is to give a subtle but real um, resistance to the MX2 protein, and specifically the MX2 protein that's found in pigtail macaques. So here are these various mutants. The, these are the positions that were mutated. The, the actual combinations of mutations occurred uh, in various forms uh, and, are, and are sort of listed here. Uh, but the variants that we found from the pigtail macaques, with one exception, which had a, a profound fitness defect associated with it, really didn't do much in terms of sensitivity to, to, to uh, human MX2, but caused uh, changed pigtail macaque MX2 from an about a tenfold inhibitor to one that inhibits infection uh, by a, about threefold. So a small but nevertheless, I'd argue, significant change in sensitivity to the, specifically to the monkey uh, form of this inhibitor. Okay, so let me summarize this uh, last part of the talk. Um, first, uh, an HIV-1 that's been adapted and engineered can indeed cause AIDS in pigtail macaque. The disease um, mimics key features of the disease in humans. Um, and crucially, and sort of tying everything together, adaptation of HIV-1 to macaques is, a, is accompanied um, by acquisition uh, effectively of resistance to antiviral proteins. And so VPU gains function to antagonize pigtail macaque tethering, and there's a, a, a reduction in sensitivity to MX2. An important feature of, of this model is that there are very stark differences in outcome that can be determined by uh, events early in infection. And I'd, I'd mention at this point a recent paper from Danny Dweck's lab where they have manipulated the interferon response just at a very short time window early in infection and had greater than expected uh, long-term effects uh, on infection uh, in an SIV model. And again, this argues that the, there are very important events that happen um, early during the infection process. Um, obviously, adaptation to the new host isn't complete. We do still have to inject the animals with an anti-CD8 antibody to give the virus some breathing space in order for it to uh, have its full virulence. Okay, let me finish by uh, thanking people who are uh, associated with uh, the work. Uh, many people in my lab uh, over the years have worked on the tethering protein, in including Feng Wen Zhang, Matthew McNatt, Sid Venkatesh, Rachel Liberatore, um, Daniel Blanco Mello did the um, evolutionary analysis along with Sid that uh, I mentioned. Um, Alumni in the lab, uh, Stuart Neal was responsible for the discovery of tethering, and David Perez Caballero um, did some of the mechanistic study. Sam Wilson, Shalini Yadav, and particularly Melissa Kane were responsible for the, for the work on uh, MX2 uh, that I showed you. Our work with the, uh, the 
trying to adapt HIV-1 to grow in, uh, in, in macaque host is very much a, a four-way collaboration that involves my group, my wife, uh, uh, Theodora Hatsuanu, and her team, who's situated just down the hall uh, uh, from my uh, laboratory. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge our collaborators here, uh, well, at NCI uh, Fred Frederick, particularly uh, Jeff Lifson and his team. And I'd especially note the contributions of Jake Estes, Brandon Keel, and Gregory Del Pet. Uh, and also uh, Michael Piatak, who very sadly uh, passed away um, very recently. Um, uh, Vinico Oramani has also been a very uh, important uh, collaborator and contributor uh, to these studies. Uh, and these uh, other collaborators uh, contributed in, in our uh, earlier work uh, uh, on the uh, tethering protein. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Hi, Paul. Wonderful talk, as usual. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, uh, since the patrol, the MX2 patrol, is not working to stop everything, and I know the early events are very important, what are or is the determinant event that makes the virus HIV escape MX2 completely, provided that it's actually at the entry at the nuclear port? because the capsid mutations are, defect, are a major you know, uh, problem for the virus. So what, what makes it, or what are the events, not one event, I'm guessing? Um, so I, I was um, perhaps uh, vague about how we think MX2 works, and that's because we don't really know. Um, so a, a favorite hypothesis is that the, the MX2 protein actually directly binds to the capsid um, as it enters or uh, approximate to the time at which it would be expected to enter uh, the nuclear pore. The genetics argues um, in favor of that type of model. And in that instance, then the mutations in capsid could just be loss of binding um, um, effects. I do have to say, though, it's been very challenging um, and impossible, in fact, in my lab to show specific interactions between the HIV-1 capsid and MX2. We can certainly show interactions, but none of the mutants that confer resistance um, abolish that interaction. So we're very suspicious about it. Another possibility is that M what MX2 might do is simply compete for factors that HIV needs to enter the nucleus. So its localization um, uh, indicates that it's in the right place uh, to do that. Um, and the fact that uh, if you um, uh, growth arrest cells, so infection has to go through a, a nuclear pore in effect, then you increase the potency. Coupled with the fact that this, this mutant, this very special mutant that's cell cycle dependent, so effectively only infects cells during, or only enters the nucleus during mitosis when there really isn't a nucleus, um, is completely resistant, is com compatible with that second notion. But distinguishing between the two is, is very difficult at present. We're gathering lots of data, we're doing lots of nuclear pouring, knockdowns, and so on, um, but uh, just not quite ready to take a position on exactly how we think MX2 is working yet. Hi, Paul, can I ask one more question? I was intrigued about the structure of tethering and the GPI tail as it gets uh, sequestered into the particle. It, is that understood how that is partitioned in particle but doesn't stay in the cell membrane? How? No, it's not clear. Um, that it happens is, is, is pretty clear, but um, why, why there's selectivity for the GPI anchor to be incorporated in the virion, we don't know. It, it might be, I mean, that as, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a long um, history about how HIV 
favors particular membrane domains, uh, lipid rafts, barges, whatever name you, you'd like to give them, um, for its assembly. And it's also true that uh, GPI anchors uh, like to partition into, into uh, uh, lipid rafts. Um, or the alternative model is that rather than actually HIV targeting a pre-existing lipid environment, it actually makes its own lipid environment as it assembles, and that that could favor incorporation of a GPI anchored protein over a, a transmembrane a domain with a, with a cytoplasmic tail. As, as you know, transmembrane domain uh, containing proteins can be incorporated into viral particles, but the rules governing that are sort of poorly understood. Bulky cytoplasmic tails aren't good, for example. Um, but um, we don't know the answer, but uh, I'm sort of comfortable with the notion that the answer is somewhere in the hand-waving that I just gave you. OK, um, if there are no further questions, so let's thank Paul for an excellent talk. And uh, please join us at the reception. <laughs>